I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. With my heart rejoicing within, with my mind focused on Him, with my hands. I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. The Father Almighty, creator of heaven and, and earth. earth. I believe I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, Son our, our Lord, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, fue crucificado, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living at the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The, Espíritu Santo. the Holy Catholic Church. The, the communion of saints. saints. The forgiveness, the forgiveness of, of sins. The resurrection of the body. And the life everlasting. Amen. 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 Amen.
standing in our midst, here with the power to heal now, and the grace to forgive. Here with the power to heal now, and the grace to forgive. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to the Hibbing Alliance Church, where we're here to prayerfully build relationships to impact lives with the transforming power of Jesus Christ and for the growth of God's kingdom. So glad you're here today. We got some great, just some exciting stuff happening today that's beyond the norm. And one of those is in a few moments we're going to hear a song and see some of the kids and hear kind of what happened in Bible school that happened last week. And uh, that's, that went really, really well. And then uh, maybe, Chris, I haven't mentioned this, but maybe you can do this for us. When the service is over, turn on the Facebook uh, program, and it'll play here or play out there. I'm not sure. Play out there in the entryway. And that'll give you an idea what happened. That was the last night. Uh, if you have Facebook, you can go on the Hibbing Alliance Church Facebook page, and we put a video presentation together for every night of the week. And so you can kind of get a glimpse visually of what happened during Bible school. So we hope you, you do that if you haven't had the chance yet. But before we get there, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. We had a really exciting week last week. Um, I don't see uh, our head trustee here this morning, so I'm not going to ask you to put the pews back today. But we have to do that at some point. We need strong backs and, and strong minds. Yeah, strong minds, yeah. People who can't figure out that these are really heavy pews. Um, but we'll have to put them back eventually uh, in the front here. Other announcements are in your bulletin. I'm just going to ask that you please read the bulletin because we have so much going on this morning, so many exciting things. I want you to be able to read that on your own and, and respond accordingly. Make sure you read the side that talks about announcements as well as the side that tells what's happening during the course of the week. So let's just take a moment to pray, and then we'll continue to worship the Lord in music. Heavenly Father, I do thank you. You are a great and awesome God. It was so exciting, Lord, to see these children come, both from our congregation and from other places, to come and learn new music and to have fun playing the games and doing the crafts and hearing the stories, Lord Jesus, the incredible offering they give toward the hospital in uh, Bangalore, uh, Gabon. And I just pray, Father, that as we hear this presentation uh, briefly this morning, that you will be blessed again. And so will we, that we will recognize, Lord, that we are implanting in our children the understanding of the love of God for them and the love of God that we express to others. Father, I pray for those who are not here this morning because of sickness. I think of Joyce Dag, Lord, and that um, damage she received in the fall. And I think of uh, Becky Finney and the operation she had uh, this last week, as well as Mary Mackey and her operation. Lord, I pray that each of them, that you will heal them, bring a, a divine healing, so that even though we have medicines and doctors and so forth, that we don't leave it to them, Lord. They don't heal. They just treat injuries. We pray that you will bring a divine healing into the lives of these folks. So I pray for those like Walt, who's going into an operation next week, and others, Lord, maybe are dealing with stuff, and we don't know, or they're not telling. But God, you are the great physician, and we just sang a song that says, I believe. I believe you heal now. And so, God, we, we press in and we ask for divine healing for the body of those that are suffering right now. We pray, Heavenly Father, for um, that which goes on around the world that we never, never hear about uh, because our news is focused more on the political slant of things rather than on the humanitarian needs of life. But, Lord, there are people that are suffering starvation in our world. There are people, Father, that are under the assault of of attacks for political reasons or religious reasons. And Lord, here we have, we have Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and risen again. The hope of the world. Help us, Father, to be those that proclaim the good name of Jesus Christ, that we truly want to make disciples and not just see them made by somebody else, but that, God, that we would be used in your service. Be with Joe and Maria Howard when they speak this morning and uh, later on during the, uh, the, the Great Commission of Women's Gathering, that, Father, that you will anoint them with the Holy Spirit, that what they share doesn't come just from experience, but, God, it comes from Jesus Christ. 
and challenge us, Lord. Challenge us in our way of life as believers. Challenge us, Lord, in understanding the need to support this in prayer and the giving of our dollars and our families' members. Help us, Lord Jesus, to understand that we are part of this globally, that you called us to be a Christ-centered family by going into all the world as witnesses under the power of the Holy Spirit in our own Jerusalem area, Hibbing, but also Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Thank you, Father, that we can worship you in the giving of our offerings, our tithes. And so, God, we just express that to you in worship and continue to praise your name in song. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore Thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. We bow down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love At the feet of Jesus We cry, holy, holy, holy We cry, holy, holy, holy We cry, holy, 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 holy Is the Lamb
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. people say amen you may be seated that is awesome that is awesome see I would like uh, to introduce Lorinda but when I do that I want everybody who is involved not the children at this point but everyone who was involved in Bible school whether it be decorating cooking teaching whatever would you please stand everyone that was doing something in Bible school look at that that is awesome thank you yeah, we got some student leaders, too, that they're, they're a little shy. They got this humility thing going on. All right, you may be seated. Thank you. I'm going to give this over to Lorinda. I told her I hope that we can get a taste of what happened in Bible school so our congregation can experience it, and so I'm going to give it over to her. Jumbo. Jumbo. Awesome. I would like for all of, I can see Josiah and Zechariah and Audrey, and I'm hoping Emery's going to come up also, and Noah and Annie. Will you please join me? If there's any other kids out there I don't see, please come up and join me. I want you guys to help me with this song. Come on up. We wouldn't have Vacation Bible School without these precious, wonderful friends of mine. Here we are. All right. And Bridget's going to help me, too. Wonderful. We're going to do a song for you, and then I want to... There's Kaylin and Haley. Wonderful. Thank you. I didn't see you at first. Brock, where are you, honey? Where's my Brock? Oh, come on. You almost got out of this. Thank you. All right. Now, did I find everybody? I was playing Where's Waldo. Okay. We're going to do a, a song for you. This is our theme song. It's Camp Kilimanjaro. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of a synopsis of our week. Kilimanjaro. Camp Kilimanjaro. For adventure, excitement is at hand. We're going on safari to a wild and distant land. From the plains of Serengeti to the jungles deep within, and to the highest mountain top, our journey now begins. Solomon, the wisest in the land, and through his words we'll learn to live. 
and, and they, they do, do a wonderful, wonderful job. job. Okay, we, we truly, truly enjoyed an epic adventure this week. We had a total of 55 young trekkers join us throughout the entire week, and we took them not only through Africa, but through Proverbs and taught them the wisdom of God's words, but most importantly, the truth of our Lord. And there, we saw an encouraging mixture of new faces. We saw also returning um, friends um, had so much wonderful time with their family during meals that Bobby and the kitchen crew um, served 80 plus people. That was the average each night. Um, our biggest and most consistent group was our fourth through sixth grade. That's the oldest group that we had, and that's exciting. That's very encouraging. Um, our mission project was for the Bongalow Hospital in Gabon. This is, I believe this was our map, Gabon. And um, their uh, Sunday school program there. And the kids, their parents, their family, their friends, they all felt moved to bring in $630.90 for this. So I just want to end by saying from planning to parade and preparation to program, over 40, to 40 adults and six youth from this church and a handful from other churches in our community made this adventure real. And through it all, we are covered, we're covered in prayer and donations by all of you. And added to this was the presence and the power of the Holy One. And this adventure really came to life for all of us. So I just want to thank you. I am overwhelmed and grateful to you all. Thank you. Just so you understand, and the kids see it this way, they come, this is all here, it's like, oh, that's no big deal. Hours of putting this up, and now hours of it taking it down. So if you want to offer to help take down, talk Lorinda. Uh, she'll, she'll be coordinating that, who was our coordinator for the week. Um, isn't that exciting? Did you mention that the, the, the goal was $400? That was the goal for the offering for the Bongalow Hospital, and it was 630 So uh, praise God for that. All right, before I introduce our speaker for the day, would you please stand as we sing one more song together? Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, Spirit, we long to embrace. 
Father, you are the one that we give the praise. We get very excited. Lord, this was an extremely uh, powerful and wonderful week. I thank you so much, Lord, for the men and women that stepped out and helped and sacrificed their time and prior to the event itself and during Bible school and then the cleanup. I thank you for our children, Lord Jesus, and I pray, God, that, yes, we want them to have fun and we want them to enjoy the songs, but more than anything, Jesus, we pray that they will understand your love for them, that they will know you care for them, that you have a divine plan just for each one of them for their future. And they are to bring praise and glory in how they carry out their life. Father, let that be impact upon each of us as we hear the message today. And we give you praise. We praise you, God. Thank you so much for your wonderful glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're sitting down, I, I do want to again rem want to remind you of uh, the fact that Chris is going to put out there on the screen in the entryway that, you, that um, little video about what happened uh, during the course of the week of Bible school. I hope you will take the time to watch it before you go. Ladies, I want to make this announcement. I haven't made it yet. We have what's called Great Commission Women, and maybe you say to yourself, well, I'm not really a part of that committee uh, you, or, or that group. We hope that you will be, um, and we hope today especially that you'll at least come as a guest. Uh, Maria Howard is uh, here, and she's going to be speaking to you after the service today. You'll go downstairs, and you'll have a, a little meal together, and us men will have to batch it uh, somewhere else. And um, so we'll get fed. We, we're good at that. We can find something to eat. But I want you to take the time to honor God, honor our guest, and also grow in your awareness of what God's doing uh, around the world for his glory. And so, ladies, after the service, uh, hopefully you will stay and be a part of the meal downstairs that's, that's been set up just for you. Um, and uh, I believe... Uh, Joe's going to speak, and Maria maybe say something, but she's speaking more downstairs. Is that right? Okay. All right, so I want to introduce our friends. First of all, before I do that, I just wanted to draw your attention to something because we've really talked about three different parts of Africa this week, and especially when we talk about the Bongalo Hospital that is not near, camp or near Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, by the way, if you want to know more about the Bongalo Hospital, it's run and operated, owned by the Christian Missionary Alliance, and there's information on that back table uh, in the sanctuary, but this symbol here is where the Bongalo Hospital generally is located in the country of Gabon. Over here is Mount Kilimanjaro, I think it's in Tanzania or Tanzania, something like that. And then in this neck of the woods, and it's, this is, he'll give us a better idea, but is where Burkina Faso is, and that's where these folks serve. Directly north of them is the country of Mali, and Mali is where they serve most of their life as servants of God in Africa, and then through civil unrest, uh, they had to move, and they were re-transitioned re to Burkina Faso. I'll let them tell all that story, but I want to introduce them. I've been thinking about this, and I'm thinking, you know, they mean a lot to Darcy and I. They are good friends. I was telling the worship team this morning that when we went out yesterday, Joe mentioned to the person that was taking our money that uh, I've known this guy for 40 years. I thought, wow, that's a long time. And so I want to tell how we met, okay, just as a brief introduction, okay? First of all, the, I'll be gentle. This is good. This is true. Uh, okay, so, so the, the, in my life, I have two good, good friends that are serving Christ. Um, I have more than that, but these two friends, when I first met them, I first saw them, not really met them, but saw them, I said to myself, I don't think I will ever really be friends with them. Joe's one of those guys. Because when he was walking to Crown College, they were dating at the time. Darcy and I were already married. And, and Joe, when he was younger, um, walked. He pivoted on his soles and his feet. So when he walked down the hall, it would be like this. And so when I was walking behind him, watching them go, I said to one of my friends, if I had a swing like that, I'd put it in my backyard for the kids. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to, to, to Joe. That's a true story, by the way. But th this is gentle. But the way that we met, and this is the strangest way, but um, I didn't go, this is self-accrimination, I didn't go to the library very often at college. Um, but I was there in my freshman year, I was in the library, and I was trying to read something 
it was spring, it was very distracting, and then these two were in the library and they were playfully arguing over a ping pong ball. And because I'm easily distracted, I was watching what they were doing. And I thought, that's kind of fun. So I walked up to them, we hadn't met yet, and I said, do you mind if I look at the ping pong ball? And they said, sure. So I grabbed it, the window was open, and I tossed it out, went back and sat down. <laughs> and that is how we met. And we have been friends ever since. We drove out to Colorado a couple times to visit them, be in their wedding. It, it, they are great friends more than anything. When we get together, we get to pray together. We get to celebrate Jesus together, talk about what God's doing in people's lives, both at, in the United States and in Africa. And so it's my privilege to introduce Joe and Maria Howard. Kevin was in Kevin was in my uh, psychology class and I sat beside him once and I found out he, as we went through everything he, everybody had to say you know their name and where they're from and all that jazz well Kevin made the distinction of saying I was married I've been married for a month and I thought this guy is weird that he's in school anyway <laughs> but he turned out to actually be okay because Darcy was his redeeming factor the reason the reason why uh, I'm up here is because ladies I wanted to personally invite you to the luncheon this afternoon or this right after the service. Not because I'm speaking, but because we're all going to get to see a glimpse of this incredible God that we serve, that lives inside us, that gives us our breath and our life. And he wants to show us what he's doing so that we can give him glory. And so I want to personally invite you to that, recognizing America has all kinds of fun things, doesn't it, Joseph? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I won't, I promise, it won't be, it's nothing's about me. It's all about God. So if you just want to get another little goutte, another little taste of this incredible God, come, come on. I promise, God's fun. Where do I put this, Kevin? R right here. Thanks. Good morning. Let's pray. Notre Seigneur, our Savior, Inquien, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we love you and worship you. We thank you that your spirit resides here in this body. And today we give you freedom to move however you choose. Purify these lips. Open our ears, soften our hearts, that you may be glorified and that we may be transformed. And we pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Yeshua, Isa Almasi. Amen. Good morning. I don't know if the kids remember. Do you remember how to say hello in my language? It's not ya girl, it's ya boy. <clears throat> we do live over in this part. We call it the heart of Africa. I don't know why Gabon thinks it's the heart. Uh, we are truly the heart of Africa. Uh, our area of Africa once was a French colony. Uh, you've heard of the Sudan, which is over near Kilimanjaro. We are French West Sudan. Um, the countries of Mali and Burkina... Mali is about twice the size of Texas, and Burkina, which just sits on the southern border, is about the size of Colorado. In both of those countries, um, a total of uh, 37 million people uh, divided between the two, nearly in half. Mali, 90% are followers of Islam. When I prayed, I used the name Isa al Masiu. Jesus the Messiah. Uh, they've taken the, the Arabic and uh, that's what we use. Uh, in Burkina, just to the south, uh, many different people groups live there. Majority uh, are, is Islam, but it's only about 54%. And Christianity is a much larger percentage. In fact, where we live in Mali, so I'm going to give you contrast between the two countries. Uh, Mali is, you've heard of Timbuktu? Yeah. 
Uh, Mali, uh, the, probably their most famous city is Timbuktu, uh, a religious center for Islam in West Africa dating back to about the 12th, 13th century. Uh, when Islam came in, they overran the people. And the people group that we work with, um, your pastor is not only an honorary member, but he's the true definition of a bozo, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Our people group are known as the bozo. In uh, one of the languages, bozo means people who live in houses of mud, which doesn't make sense because everybody lives in houses of mud. But anyway, the bozo, uh, it's a derogatory term, um, but it's, if you look up on the internet, if you have your phones and you're bored, you can look up bozo, and you'll find that there's about 300,000 bozo living in Mali and in Burkina and in other neighboring countries. Um, the, the Bozo were some of the first to convert. They lived on the river. Islam traveled by way of the river. It was the w best way to get into our area of Africa. And so the Bozo quickly converted. It was convert or die. And why not just convert? So that's what the Bozo did, and they're very proud of that fact. They believe that they can trace their roots way back to the first Muslims that came in. We ask, what happened before then? Our village is well over 400 years old, the village of Sofaraba. Uh, and just to the south of us, National Geographic did an uh, archaeological dig in the late 80s and found that uh, a certain Bozo village by the name of Jene traces its time back to the time of Christ. And the Bozo are very proud to be such an old people group. They are considered one of the first three, first uh, of three people groups that moved into that part of Africa. And so their history goes way back. They're proud of Islam. They're proud of the fact that they're outsiders in everybody else's world. They're so focused on themselves. Uh, the Bozo need Jesus. The Bozo um, today, we know of a handful of believers after 25 years, 26 years of service in West Africa, um, the, the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been very slow among the Bozo people. But that's okay. God is doing his work. And God has promised through Jesus Christ, his son, he said, I will build my church and what's the rest of it? The gates of Hades itself cannot withstand it or overpower it. Do you believe that for here in Hibbing? We're going to talk about Africa, but we're going to be really self-focused as well today. So you have this large country of Mali. Uh, the, uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance moved in in 1923, and the work has been expanding in other people groups, not so much among the Bozo. When we first went to work among this people group, we were the first expatriates, uh, the first foreigners to ever learn their language. And it has opened up many doors. In 2012, we had uh, an overthrow of the government. Right? 2012. Go so quickly. And uh, we were forced to leave because Al-Qaeda had come in and taken over the area that we were in. Uh, we weren't going to leave until one of our friends, he's a deacon and elder in the biggest church in the area about two hours away. We've known him since our first uh, days in Mali. He's our Malian father. And David called and said, Joseph, where are you? And I said, we're, we're at home. He says, what are you doing there? You need to leave. And we said, oh, David, we're out. Our village is 200 people at max. Very small. We're off the beaten path. I said, it's peaceful here. He said, Joseph, don't think of yourself. Think of the non-believers around you. What if the enemy would come into your village? The first thing that they would do is attack and kill non-believers because you're there. So we left. Are you going to talk about this later downstairs? Yeah, our leaving and everything? Nah. So I'm not taking away from you women that want to... Uh, hear more yet, uh, later. Um, as we were driving out the next morning, Maria says, how long are we going to be gone? I said, three days. Well, it's now been three years. 
But that's okay. God is in control and God is at work. Uh, we just heard sad news from that uh, where David lives, that about two hours from where we live. It's not really that far. It's only about 45 miles from where we live. Um, terrorists attacked and killed several individuals. There were a total of 12 deaths. Uh, this was Friday and Saturday. You heard about it on the news, right? No, you never do. Um, uh, foreigners and nationals were killed as terrorists came in to attack. But God is at work, and that's what I want you to know today, that God is always at work. Nothing is going to hinder God's work. So we moved to Burkina Faso, um, a funny named country. The capital city you'll love, Ouagadougou. Ouagadougou is uh, the home of an old, another old uh, people group. And Burkina itself is from the More language, and it means honorable or respected. And Faso is from another people group in the area, the Jula, and it means father's house. So when you think of Burkina Faso, you can think of respected or honorable father's house. And so we're living in a respected, honorable father's house, and we truly are. Uh, as we move to Burkina, the area that we're living in now has many churches, 60 churches in our state uh, out of 155 villages. We have 50 pastors uh, that are working to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. One people group is probably 30% followers of Jesus. That's fantastic. There's five other people groups in that state that have no witness at all. And the Bozo are one of them. In Mali, where we come from, uh, you have to literally go uh, 45 miles to the first church that you'll find. Uh, other than that, there are no believers in our region uh, other than in one particular area. The gospel has been spreading the same at the same time. We moved into that part of Africa at the same time. Some people have been receptive, some are not. What I want to share with you this morning, that was just my introduction, and I'm so glad I can't see a clock back there. I, oh, there it is. I found it. But that's okay. Uh, Kevin said the Vikings game isn't until tonight. So there's food downstairs if we get hungry. Um, and so we can go eat that, right, Darcy? Sure. I want to take you, tell you a story. A long time ago, there were two men. And these men were seeking hard after God. It was hard to find God where they were. But they heard of a teacher. And so they went out to follow that teacher, to hear from him. Because it was said of this teacher that he had the keys of life. He knew truth. And he was pronouncing the coming of a Savior, of the Messiah. And so these two men went out to the desert. And they found this spokesperson for the coming kingdom. And they listened to him. And often he would say, I am not he, but the one who is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. And John and Andrew followed him. And one day, this prophet said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it pricked something in John and Andrew's heart. <coughs> <coughs> And so they went to find him. And the prophet said, go, he is the one that you've been seeking. And John and Andrew went to follow. They soon asked, Master, where are you staying? And he said, come and follow me. John and Andrew. Andrew couldn't withhold the joy in his heart. And he went running to find his brother. We don't know if he was a bigger brother or a younger brother. I expect that Peter was the bigger brother, the older brother. And he went and said, Peter, we found him. Come and see. And Peter came. And Peter met 
Jesus for the first time. And Jesus says this strange thing, oh, you're Peter, but from now on, I'm going to call you the rock. But that wasn't enough for Andrew. Andrew has to go again, and he finds another and says, come and see. We know the rest of the story, don't we? Twelve men huddle around this teacher, this Messiah, and follow him wherever he goes until the day that he's betrayed. And even the rock falls. But that's okay. Jesus knew all that. Jesus foretold it all. And Jesus said, Peter, later, do you love me? As many times as he denied Christ, Jesus gave him the opportunity to confess and say, yes, I do. That was the beginning of a life, a world-changing movement that you and I are a part of today. Because we follow this same Jesus, do we not? Our joy is to go and tell others that which we have seen, heard, and touched. John, the same John that was with Andrew at the beginning, I love it, in 1 John chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to paraphrase it for you, but I'd like you to see what John says. John is introducing, he's writing a letter to his dear children, a church somewhere. Maybe it's to all the churches at that time. John is the last disciple living. All the others have been killed. He's been put out to pasture in a prison. And yet he has this love for these young ones. They're not children like our children who are at VBS. They're like you and I. Those who possibly had not seen Jesus but had believed because of the testimony of his followers. And here in 1 John chapter 1, (coughs) John says, That which I have seen, that which I have touched, that which I have heard, I share with you. Where we are in Africa... If you tell a story, one of the first questions is, did you see it with your own eyes? Gossip is such a big thing the world around, isn't it? Oh, did you hear what I heard? And the best response is, did you actually see that? Now we have it on the internet, uh, and half, half, almost all of what we see on the internet is false, and are productions of people's um, uh, thoughts. But where we are, it's, have you seen it with your own eyes? Here John is telling you and I, I saw this Jesus. I heard this Jesus. Not only that, I touched him. And I want to share with you that. I believe that John, as an old man, was not just reliving the past. It was still burning within him. i got to tell you what I saw. The purpose of my talk today I better read exactly what I wrote. The challenge that we have is this week, may our encounter with Jesus overflow in giving people around you access to encounter this same Jesus. I love the fact that you guys are involved in making disciples. It's not the role of the pastor to make disciples. It's not the role of the Sunday school teacher to make disciples. It's our role as followers of the risen Jesus. That which we've experienced, we must tell others. You know, it's not just a New Testament thing. This is a something that goes way back to the very beginning of time. Uh, the, the psalmist in Psalm 46, 8 says, Come and see what the Lord has done. Again in Psalm 66, 5, Come and see what the Lord has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. The psalmist had to proclaim, and those were the songs of the day. Come and see. See what our God has done. In, in, in that last passage, uh, the psalmist goes on to recount 
the entire history of the children of Israel. <laughs> Calling them out from Abraham, the promise to Abraham, and going into uh, to Egypt and then becoming slaves and then called out of that and brought to the brink of the promised land and then the sin that followed and the wandering in the desert and then finally he's re recounted it all and he's saying come and see what do you tell others does your life say come and see come and see how do I make this practical for us today uh, <clears throat> You know, when we have an encounter with Jesus, it forces us into something. There is no one that has had a, an encounter with Jesus that one of these two responses are not the outcome of. One is, no, I'm not interested. Even it's, if it's, oh, wait, let me think about it. Anytime you have to wait and think about it, it's a no. My children taught me that. Hey, Dad, can we go to Dairy Queen? Well, I'll think about it. And I, I heard them turn to their mother and say, Oh, we don't get to go. <laughs> Wait a second. Give me a chance to even think about it. By the way, we do have two sons. One's in Minneapolis, St. Paul area, in Vergrove Heights. His name is Joshua. Our second son is Jacob, and uh, they are in Guinea in West Africa, right on the coast, right there. Um... And they've been there for a month now. And they're following Jesus as uh, proclaimers of the truth uh, to people who have never heard. But once you and I have encountered Jesus, there's two reactions. I'll think about it, which means no, or yes. I want to give you an example of a yes. In our uh, life in, in Mali, in West Africa, <sighs> The first thing they ask was, why are you here? And our response is always, God desires to speak with you. And he wants to talk to you in your own language. And so we learned the language. And so year after year, our responsibility is to proclaim Jesus however we can. Uh, yes, it's doing good things, but for the most part, it's proclaiming. We want to proclaim Jesus. Our actions must show it, but our words must talk about it. And so we talk about Jesus. When our oldest son, Josh, was in high school, he came home and said, Dad, I know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I said, fantastic, Josh, what's that? He says, I'm going to do exactly what you do. Great. Tell me what it is you think I do. And he said, you do absolutely nothing. <laughs> Anybody want a job like that? He said, all you do is sit underneath a tree and talk to people about Jesus all day long. My son saw that proclamation was really important. Now, we've done a whole lot of different things, but we proclaim Jesus. Him crucified. Jesus, the Son of God, even to Muslims. And we love to talk about God. So uh, year after year, first decade passes, not one believer. Five years more, no believers. Finally, after 17 years, this young man said, Joseph, I have seen Jesus in you as you've spoken of him. I want to know Jesus. And he boldly, he, I say he was a young man. He was in his mid-30s at the time, married with two wives, many children, and yet he had been watching. He said, I've been watching since you first came. And I know that this is true, and I want to follow. He lived a whole year as the only believer in our village, besides Marie and I. Uh, and he had a boldness and a courage in the face of much adversity to proclaim, come and see what I have seen. Finally, one day, his older brother, Mommy, the oldest sibling, uh, came to us and said, Joseph, my wives, he had two wives, they need to know Jesus. And I said, I know. He said, no, if they knew Jesus, they'd really honor me and respect me and follow my, my wishes. So I want you to come to our house tonight and show us the Jesus film one more time. We'd done it how many times? And so this was, he was making that proclamation in front of everybody, not only his family, but the old men of the village. 
And so that night, we went and showed the Jesus film in his village. And I won't go into all the, the, the details, but at the end of that, Mommy accepted Jesus. Yes, one of his wives accepted Jesus. Uh, and she boldly said, I will follow. And then after she prayed her prayer of confession and faith, um, in front of everybody, we turned to Mommy and said, your wife just accepted Jesus, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to accept Jesus too. And he prayed for Jesus to come in and take away the sin, all those things that have separated him from God, and to recognize that none of his prayers or his good deeds would ever earn him the right to be with God in heaven. And he confessed that. But to be honest with you, I didn't believe it. I thought he was just doing it. You see, about 10 years previously, he said, Joseph, I want you to change my name. I want to be called Peter from now on. And I said, why is that? Well, Christians do that, don't they? When they convert, they leave their Muslim ways behind, and and they, they change their name. And I said, yes, but they don't do it until after they've been changed. You can't take on the name of Peter and then expect to be changed. So 10 years went by. We had given him a Bible. He had learned to read in Arabic. Uh, he was a um, uh, Garibu, uh, Islamic student. Uh, his teacher was a traveling Marabu. And he could, uh, he could read Arabic somewhat, but he wanted to learn to read in the national trade language. So we gave him a Bible. Um, and I thought, what a waste. Well, he had begun to learn to read. Ten years. This night, he gave his life to Jesus, and yet I doubted. The next morning, um, when it was just his brother, every morning we would meet together. We would have church every morning and every evening. You want to start doing that here? One thing for us, when it's an illiterate society, how are you going to get the Word of God into people's hearts? You can't say, hey, just go home and read your Bible. So that was our habit, our what we normally did, and uh, Bada, the first one, would come. Well, that first morning, uh, Mommy didn't show up. Um, I thought, wonderful. Here he made a confession, and already. And all day long, we looked for him. We couldn't find him. We would sit out underneath a tree. You know, I talk about Jesus underneath a tree. It happened to be where his family, they were blacksmiths. Uh, in the in the village and that's where all the men gather so it was the best place to be he wasn't there all day long so at evening time we went back into our courtyard and we were going to have our our time with the the believers again and uh, halfway into it mommy shows up and he's got this huge smile on his face i said mommy where have you been he said joseph jesus changed me i had to go to every house in our village and tell them of the change in my own life, pay back debt that I had, uh, confess lying and cheating. And so I spent the whole day conf- going to, from house to house. He was saying what I'm saying we must be doing. Come and see. We rejoiced that evening again. And over the weeks, We would continue to meet out under the tree. And instead of having our church service in our courtyard, we'd have it out where everybody could come. And they wanted to see the change in mommy, specifically. Several weeks into it, in the evening, 6 o'clock, everybody goes off for prayer, the men do. And it was time for prayer. And one of the influential men of the village stood up and said, It's prayer time, let's go to the, the mosque and turned to Mommy and to Bada, his younger brother, and said, come with us. And Mommy and Bada immediately said, we don't do that anymore. We don't need to go to the mosque and pray. We don't gain merit by doing that. We pray to God throughout the day, and we're not going to do that. And this man was incensed. He said, how can you not go? If you don't go... You know we have a microphone and a loudspeaker. We're going to proclaim to the whole village that you're no longer Muslims, but you're Christians. The both men stood up and smiled and said, would you do it? We've been telling them, but if it comes from you, they'll believe it. 
Mommy, Bada, and Kobe are transformed lies who are proclaiming constantly, come and see, come and see. There are two biblical stories that follow this. One would be the woman at the well. You know her story, right? Such an honorable woman. She had to go to the well by herself. Now, you may have a well on your property, but where we're from, they understand this story. Maria would say to Darcy, hey, Darcy, let's go to the well. And when you go, all the other women are there. Now, depending on where you go, we're on the river, so our wells are not that deep. In fact, prior to our coming to the village, there was only one well, and it was filled in. They used the river water for everything, but the river was the well. So everybody goes to the well at the same time, right? And here's this poor woman going out to the well all by herself. You know the story. I want to just get to the fun part. After encountering Jesus, what does she do? Someone say it. She goes back into the heart of the village and says, Come and see a man who told me all about myself. The neat thing about the end of chapter 4, <laughs> these outsiders, they weren't even true Jews. They were Samaritans. The hatred between the two is amazing. They enticed Jesus to stay a couple of days so he can teach. Now, of course, back at home, that doesn't set too well. The religious leaders later on say, you spent time in the Samaritan village. But at the end of chapter 4, I think it's verse 48, they say, we don't, we don't believe now just because she told us. We believe because we have seen and heard. Huh. Catch the theme? What do people see and hear from you the newest video games the newest cute thing that you get on the internet the story that you heard from somebody else who told you that they had heard from someone else what they had heard we preach jesus and him crucified a stumbling block to the Jews, but life to you and I. What do you, what do people hear you speak about? One last story. Jesus is uh, in Luke. <clears throat> He's spoken to a huge crowd of people, gets in his boat, and they take him across the lake, and they land at a cemetery. Bozo, our fish, they're the fishermen in West Africa, they would never land the boat at a cemetery. It is a forbidden place. And yet somehow Jesus directs the boat and says, No, Peter, you don't know what you're doing. I want to land here. Now, we don't hear that in the story. But the truth of the matter is there's no way that a fisherman, someone who knew the lake, would land his boat at a cemetery. It's a defiled place. You don't go there. We know the story, right? Jesus gets off the boat and immediately this hurting man comes running up naked and says, what do you have to do with us, Jesus, Son of God? Remember the story? And Jesus says, oh no, I made a mistake. Get in the boat. Let's go. He casts out a legion of demons into the swine of uh, the herd of pigs who end up killing themselves. Now, the interesting thing here, the pig herds, herders, is that what you call them? Swine herders? They run back to town and rejoice that the demon-possessed man is healed. He killed our pigs! says in Luke that when this man is in his right mind they've cleaned him up and they bring him to Jesus and it's the one and only time Jesus says don't come and follow me 
It blows my mind. What does he say? Go and tell your family. In other words, go and show them the change in your life. Now, we have no idea what happened to this man. Maybe sometime a million years from now, as we're feasting our eyes on Jesus, maybe he'll saddle up to us and say, I was that man. He changed me. But I can imagine a man that has been so transformed went back to his family and said, See, look at me now. I'm not troubled in my mind anymore. My heart is free. I found freedom in Jesus. Don't you want to know him? The sad thing is, a high percentage of those that have heard, who would have heard him would not respond. Let me think about it. Let me see if it's really real. Well, that's good for you, and I'm glad you experienced it, but you don't know my pain. You don't know my hurt. Uh, can Jesus really do something for me? Have you ever heard those things? Jesus is telling us today, come and see. Come and see. And it's our responsibility to be, to, to be the people who have those transformed lives that are changed, that can see that Jesus is real. I've seen it in Mali, West Africa. And we're seeing it in Burkina Faso. As I said, in our area of Burkina, the church has been there since the day I was born. 1957, the first missionaries went into this area. Kevin's a whole lot older than I am. He's seen so much more than I've ever seen. 1957 to now, as I said, from no believers to 60 churches, 50 pastors, a couple more in, in uh, Bible school, and yet uh, roughly 95 other villages that have never heard of Jesus. Now, um, Chisholm is how far from here? Five miles. Is there another village, I almost said, town that's closer? Is that the closest one? How, how big is that? 70 people. That's one of our villages. And how far from, that, uh, from here is that? Halfway? Imagine that the people in that town have never heard anyone speak of Jesus. It's not our village. It's not our town. It's not our responsibility. Besides, they're a different people group than we are. If they want to know about Jesus, they know where this church is. They can come to our church, right? Village after village after village. Some as uh, uh, close as a mile apart. And there's no witness at all. Primarily because they're not like us. They speak a different language. Their village smells different than ours. Because that village has all the cattle. Or that village is where all the fish is from. And you know what rotten fish smells like, right? Five different people groups in our state in our area of Burkina Faso that have no witness at all, primarily because, I would say it, you, the people, won't share Jesus. That would never happen here, right? We've been in villages where the next neighborhood over, you, people don't, we talk about homogenous people, oh, we all get along, right? Guess what? It's the human heart not to get along with others. And so one neighborhood will be one people group. Another neighborhood will be another people group. This neighborhood is completely Christian, and that one never hears of Jesus. How can that be? So three years ago, we were invited to come and work with all of these churches to help them say, come and see. And so I'm doing the same thing today here. I don't know how many churches there are here. I've seen a lot. But guess what? Our neighbors need to know Jesus, and the only way they're going to know is as you proclaim Jesus and say, come and see. 
I want you to have the best job in the world. That job that wherever you're sitting, it's like underneath a tree and all you're doing is talking to people about Jesus all day. But you say, oh, I can't do that at work. I, I, I can't talk to people about Jesus. I heard your pastor's wife, Darcy, say, it's amazing. People at Kohl's come up to me and say, would you pray for me? Huh? You, you carry your Bible around all the time, right? Someone does something wrong, you just hit them over the head. And, only him. I wonder why those lumps are there. Do you see where I'm coming? I love missions. I love the fact that God called Maria and I, sent us through churches like yours to places that have never heard. And I love coming back and telling you wonderful stories of what God is doing. But I expect the same thing here. I would expect you afterwards to come up and say, can I tell you my story? How God used me to say, come and see? The great thing about this is age makes no difference. From the youngest to the oldest. Many times it's the youngest ones who are the boldest. They don't know any better. They don't get embarrassed. Or maybe it's because it is real, real to them. Our challenge today is this week, how is God going to use you to say to someone else, come and see? Now, it presupposes at least one thing, that Jesus is doing something in your life. So I have to ask, I'm a missionary, I get the right to do this. Do you know Jesus? Does he know you? Guess what? He knows you whether you know it or not. Those secret things way down in the depths of your heart that you say, oh, I can't give that up. It's either too embarrassing or it was a long time ago or, or, and Jesus says, I already know. Come to me. I would basically guarantee that there's someone here today that has been living a life that doesn't say, come and see Jesus. Is that you? Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you a lot more work to do. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke. Now, the yoke is a, 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 a tool of work. But his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I love the front of churches here. They're wonderful places to meet God. Do you need to come and meet him today? Do you want to proclaim, Jesus, I want to be yours? I've lived the life of a lie for a long time and I want it to be finished today. I want to be transformed either like the woman at the well, or the man in the cemetery. Come and see! Jesus is saying, come. Would you take that step today? Secondly, there's many out here who are tired and heavy laden. You've been working a long time trying to get anybody to see Jesus. And you're saying it's just not working. 17 years, guys! What a success. 17 years and come back to the States and say, yep, no believers yet. That's okay. Remember what I started with? Jesus said, I will build my church. It's not Pastor Kevin. It's not Missionary Joe. It's not you. It's Jesus says he'll build his church. That church may start in your own family. I have a son that does not love Jesus. 30 Seven years working with him. He wrote me a letter yesterday and said, Dad, no matter what you do, I won't ever change my mind. How can that be? I have an older brother. Same age as you. Just turned 60. I'm okay. I'm a good guy. 
It's okay. It's all under God. And God is in control. And God knows your situation. And God is working around you. And God is working in you. And those that seek him will truly find him. I want you to find him today. So I'm going to ask the, the, uh, the worship leaders to come forward. And we're going to get ready to sing our last song and close this down. But I know God is working. He's working in my own heart. Perhaps he's working in yours. I have no idea what this closing song is, but I know that God has chosen it, and we're going to rejoice in it together. And I'm going to say that even during this song, come. Can I see a, a raise of hands of our elders, our spiritual leaders in the church? Where are you? Okay, one, way back there. Okay, three. Okay, gentlemen, as you see if... Uh, a boy or a man comes forward, would you come and pray with them, stand beside them? I don't know, Darcy, who the spiritual women leaders in the church are, but you know who you are, and if God is working in a, a, a girl's life or a woman's life, would you please come and stand beside them? And we're going to let you walk with them because they're your family. Okay? So I think we want to stand. Right, Pastor yes. Kevin? So I'll stand together. I'm going to pray just briefly. And then, okay. So would you bow with me in prayer? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh and new upon us today. Break the, the chains that bind us. And Father, if you're working in the heart, I know you're working in the heart of people today, but if there's someone here that say, I need Jesus... I need to give him my entire life. I'm tired of living my own life. Father, make their feet to move boldly to this throne. For those who are heavy laden with the, the, the weight of ministry and life and, and, and not seeing victory and, and you know what you're doing, Jesus, we give you the freedom through your spirit. And I pray, Father, that you would give boldness to us to hear softness of a heart to respond. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We sing the song, Men, you start the song, and would you be men of valor and start the movement of what we've been challenged with? Men of faith, rise up and sing of the grace are strong when you feel weak, in your brokenness complete. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is saving to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Ladies. here. We've been through fire, we've been through rain, we've been refined by the power of his name. We've fallen deeper in love with you, you burned the truth on our lips. We will shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. We will shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, church, with broken wings, fill this place with songs again.
As we go to prayer, I still want to give the invitation still open. If you would like to come and pray, then you move this way as others are moving out the door. And elders and deaconesses, if you would just remain and watch to make sure that there's someone to pray with our folks as they come forward. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're talking about proclamation. A proclamation begins when we bow our knee to you, when we surrender totally, freely to you. And then we proclaim. So, Father, as we sing the song about shouting to the Lord, in the north and the south and the east and the west, let it begin with our surrender to you. Lord, if there is someone here that has never given their life to Christ, Lord, I pray for that person right now that your Holy Spirit will just impose on that person the need right now to surrender to Jesus. If there's someone here that's been struggling with some issues in their life, Father, and they have keeping it hidden from other people, but they know that you know, Lord, by your Spirit, bring them conviction to surrender that today to you so that they can say, come and see what Jesus has done. Thank you, Father, for those who have stepped out. And if there's others, the Lord, I pray that you will woo them by your Spirit to surrender, to enjoy the freedom that comes with that confession. And then, Lord, give us each boldness to share to our neighbors, our family members, our co-workers, those in our neighborhood, come and see. Come and know this Jesus who redeems and saves and heals. Thank you, Father. Lord, continue now to be with the ladies when they go downstairs and they have this time together with Maria. Lord, use her to continue to open their understanding to the glory of what you're doing and what you want to do in people's lives. Just be with them, I pray, in a blessing. Thank you, Father, again for your presence here. Let us this week not only be given, but take that opportunity to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray in your name. Amen. As you leave uh, the sanctuary, please go quietly as the music's played. And for those who are praying.